and welcome everybody to our UXCX USA online series, the first of 2023. So thank you for joining and I hope you're as excited as I am for our talk this evening. Um, and unfortunately it is just a singular talk tonight because unfortunately Danny, due to unforeseen circumstances, will not be able to present tonight. So apologies if you were excited to hear from her, but we will be rescheduling and um, we'll let you know as soon as we have a confirmed date for when Danny can share because I was really excited to, to learn from her talk as well tonight. Um, but before we jump into Ben's talk, what I want to do is give a very quick introduction to UXCX and what it is that we do at UXCX and why we host these events. So our mission at UXCX is to help companies shift from building software through projects to empowered autonomous product teams. And the reason why that's our mission is that we believe it's a more efficient, effective, and sustainable way of working in high change environments. So you're constantly having new kind of competitors, new products, new, new entrants into the market. And if you're trying to work through that waterfall way of working, you just can't react quickly enough. So by having an empowered team there who are close to the customer, understand their needs, and are able to iterate quickly and move towards the right product, that's what we believe is needed to move forward in kind of business today. Um, and that's all well and good to say, oh, just swap over between those two from projects to product teams. But it's harder to do in practice than you would think. And that's why we invite people to come and share their kind of knowledge, experience and case studies of how they are kind of making some bits of that process kind of change. So we're, we're inviting people across product management, UX research, designers and developers to share how they're changing their ways of working. Now, as the talk goes on, Hopefully you'll have some questions because that means you're trying to think about how you can apply what you're learning to your situation. So please do ask those questions. There's a chat box at the side on our website at UXCX. Um, but there's also, you can chat through whether it's LinkedIn, Facebook, um, YouTube, wherever you're watching this from. And we'll put those questions to the speaker. Sometimes we run out of time and too many questions come in. So that's why we have the UXCX community Slack group. And in there, one of the channels is Ask the Speakers. So any questions that we don't have time to ask tonight, we'll put them in there and we'll invite Ben to come in and answer those questions for you as well. But that's enough about me. You're not here to listen to me talk. So I'd like to introduce our first speaker for the evening and, and our, our only speaker this evening, but it's Ben Callahan, who's the president at Sparkbox, and he'll be talking about maturing design systems. So I'd like to welcome Ben to the stage. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm, you. I'm okay. Cheers. <laughs> Actually, I'll start off with a quick story. Um, about eight or I think it's probably eight or nine years ago now, uh, we were approached by a large retailer to help them with, uh, believe it or not, a responsive redesign. Do you remember those <laughs> back in the day? A responsive redesign of their product detail page. And um, it's a, it was a large organization. This single template on their website was responsible for billions of dollars, actually, of revenue every year. And so this was a huge deal for their organization to undertake. Um, so we spent an entire year working alongside their team. And we just researched and iterated and really, truly kind of worked on this thing um, to get it to be one of the best pages we could make that would help um, their customers make really easy purchases online. And they had multiple brands. And so this single template served all of those brands. <clears throat> so after a year of that work, that, that project went live and um, it was a, a massive success. Everybody was really excited about it. And there was a lot more work to do, right? That was one template inside of an entire e-commerce experience. And so the client asked us if we would continue on and sort of take some of that good work that we'd done and spread it around the rest of that experience. And we said we would love to do that. But um, we actually said, Let, give us give us a couple of days to just try something. And so we went back, um, our team, this was kind of before design systems was really a thing people talked about. Um, and we took a look at the work we had done on this single page. And we realized that by default, kind of the way we were working at the time was to, to take a very systematic approach to the work. And so at, with a little bit of exploration and a couple ideas and some prototyping, we kind of took some of those things back to the client and said, if we could spend about three months here taking this work that we've done, refactor it into 
what became a design system for them, we think we could be much more uh, efficient, much more consistent across the rest of the experience. So they were excited about that idea. And so we jumped into that work with them. Um, three months later, we had the sort of first version of a system for them. It was very basic at the time, but um, it worked really well. We saw that uh, increase our efficiency across the rest of, uh, of that um, e-commerce ex experience. And a year after that, so we're now two years into working with this client, um, we had almost 12 different organizations inside their company were subscribers to that system. And um, lots of people in the company were excited about it. Uh, but then I got a phone call <laughs> from somebody. Um, our, our connection inside the, the client called me and said, hey, we need you to stop all the work that you're doing on the design system. And at the time, we were a fairly small company. This was a big project for us. So that was a bit of a scary call to receive, to have somebody say, stop all the work and not really to give us a reason why. And I think that's really the moment for me that I realized we as an organization, my company, Sparkbox, needed to better understand design systems. We needed to better understand the, the reasons our clients would want them, um, the politics involved in implementing them. And so that moment kind of was the start. I look back at that moment as kind of the start for my journey on this sort of uh, a bunch of research that we've been doing into design systems ever since. Um, so this year we released our fifth edition of the design systems survey. You can see that online. I'll share links and stuff towards the end. Um, but we just ask lots of questions of folks in the industry trying to solve these problems as well. Um, and we kind of take those results and aggregate them and share back what we learn. Um, so this, this kind of information, I do tons of um, interviews with folks who also are doing design system work. That's a big part of how we keep the survey relevant is just chatting with folks like yourselves who are in the work. And then of course we do lots of work with clients. We help um, big organizations that want to implement systems or um, that are having a hard time with their systems. Um, so what I'm going to share with you today comes from all of that research, all of this work, and um, just from sort of being in the conversation for the last, you know, seven or eight years around systems. Um, now, <clears throat> when I say design system, there's a lot of confusion still is one thing that I've learned. So I do want to spend a few moments just saying, let's, let's just define what I mean when I say design systems, because I think a lot of people have different ideas about what, oh, what, what those words mean when you put them together. And I think any good definition should start with some context. For us, the context is that every organization is trying to connect its brand to some audience. Pretty much every client we work with, all of the companies that you work for, um, this is just kind of what we do, right? And so we do that in a lot of different ways. Sometimes we print stuff and mail it to people. Sometimes we create an amazing in-store experience and invite people to come in and sort of be a part of the brand in some way. Um, sometimes we you know, create ads, um, perhaps audio ads and a podcast you listen to, or even a billboard somewhere that you might see as you're driving. Um, lots of different ways that you can advertise. And Pretty much every organization today has a major touch point here of digital experiences. So these are things like your website or any native applications that you might have. If you have digital products, um, you know, a kiosk, all these kinds of things that have a sort of a digital interface. Um, and this, I believe, is kind of helps us to understand sort of where, where, where a design system fits inside of an organization. And I believe that it fits here. They sit between the brand and these digital experiences that we're offering to our customers. I think it's important to think about this because this helps us see what feeds into a design system, what are the inputs of a design system, and what does a design system have to offer as its outputs. And so when we think about it like this, we can then break things down and, and, and actually come up with a definition that helps us understand in the big picture, in this context, what a system is. What I also like about this little bit of context is that if we think about it in this way, a design system then creates consistency with all those other touch points, the print things, the advertising, the in-store experiences, because they're all rooted in that brand. So let's talk about this, this little... Uh, vague sort of box that says design system. What does what is made up of, uh, inside of this box? I believe that uh, design systems start with foundations. And the foundations layer is a subset of the organization's brand with the intent that it's used 
in the design and development of digital interfaces. And there's lots and lots and lots of things that can exist at this sort of inner foundations layer. Um, <clears throat> you'll see the word guidelines a lot here because I think a lot of what we're offering here is you know, a point of view, a guideline for our designers, developers, UXers, product folks, all of them to think about when they're working on digital interfaces. Um, and of course, this is not uh, extensive. Like there's many other things that could exist at this foundations layer, but these are the kinds of things you could expect to see here. Um, once we've got that sort of from the brand, a, a subset of those things defined in the foundations, then we can create a tokens layer. And uh, the tokens layer is a set of codified design decisions that are based on the things we defined in that foundations layer. Now, um, the goal of this tokens layer is to take those concepts that we express in the foundations layer and codify them. And when I say codify, all I mean is that those concepts are really given a name and a value. And there's lots of things that we can codify things like color. We could say, I want to have brand blue is the name, and here's a definition for that hex value of that color. And now when people use that brand blue token, they know they're getting the right color, the right version of the blue. And that's one tiny example. You can codify lots and lots of things. Um, and again, this is not extensive, um, but this, these, these are the kinds of things that you might see in a token system. <clears throat> now, um, once we've got foundations and tokens defined, then we can create what I call the core systems layer. And this is really a set of building block systems that are used to solve common interface challenges. So one way to think about this layer is that at the tokens layer, we're codifying a single design decision. But here, this is maybe how we codify how all of those design decisions could work together in, in a specific area. So you might create a token for spacing, something like how much margin do we want in a certain context? But then we might use that token in a bigger system around layout. How do we handle layout on a page, as an example? And of course, there's lots of core systems that we can create, <clears throat> things like layout and grid systems, theming systems, type scale, animation, all of these kinds of things. Again, this is just a few examples. There are many that you could create. So these three inner layers, we just call the fundamental layers. That's because this is what everything else is sort of based on. Um, and if you're someone who's building or maintaining a design system, then creating stability in these three inner fundamental layers is going to be a big part of your job. And once we have these defined, we can add in a fourth layer. And that fourth layer in the anatomy of a design system, we call the components layer. And this is just the reusable parts of a digital interface. This is what most people think of when they talk about a design system. These are the things you see when you look at an interface, uh, form inputs or labels or text next to pictures, search results listing, all that kind of stuff. Um, they can be simple uh, like an input or they can be complex like maybe a search bar that includes you know, a label, an input and a button. Um, so you can nest them to create more complexity. Um, now, when you are working on a system, oftentimes you start in this inner part towards the foundations and you work out. But the folks who use your system, we, we call them subscribers, those folks are gonna approach your system from the outside in. So they're gonna come to this and hopefully most of what they need exists at that components layer. <clears throat> so again, a few examples I've listed here, things like buttons and text inputs, radio uh, buttons, tooltips, tabs, breadcrumbs, all of this kind of stuff, many, many more. Um, and if you go look at some examples of design systems, you'll find probably hundreds of these that, you, that we could list here. Now, all of this stuff is very conceptual. So um, what I like to do is break it down a little bit further. Um, each of these layers can be sort of broken down into three parts, assets, processes, and documentation. So we'll just quickly look at each. Assets are the tangible things that make each of these layers very usable. Um, so here's a few examples. At the foundations layer, we might have some logo files, right? So these take up space somewhere. That's That makes them sort of an asset, something very functional. Um, at the tokens layer, we may have a, a CSS file that contains uh, color variables, co CSS variables in, in, um, in a file. And this is for someone who's doing web work, perhaps. And they've, um, we've said, hey, here's the colors we want to use in the interface. And we've created uh, for them a CSS file that contains variables 
um, in this case, white, gray 10, gray 50, those are created from the tokens files. So a very um, helpful tool that somebody could just import directly into a project and get access to the correct colors. At the core systems layer, we may have uh, like an example of a way to, to do layout. In this case, I've got a quick little SAS mix in the, again for the web where it might help you to put together a little um, layout in your, in your interface. And then at the components layer, we may have a sp specific component like a button or something in Figma for a design person to use. So again, just examples, there will be lots and lots of assets in your system. Here's what you, what you might expect to see, um, one example from each of those layers. Moving on from assets, we have processes. And when I say that, I just mean that these are the things that explain how the humans work um, on and with and sort of around the system. Um, so a few examples here, lots and lots of, of, of processes that you might want to define, but they generally fall into these categories, things around communication, governance, um, synchronization or testing, deprecation, onboarding, extending the system, all of this kind of stuff. These are areas where we need to put some process in place. Um, let's look at a few examples at each layer. At the foundations layer, we may define a process for how the brand team and the design system team communicate. And we said early on that the system is, is sort of a subset, the foundations layer is a subset of the, the stuff that exists at the brand. And so when those things change at the brand level, we need to have a, a process that communicates that to the systems team so we know how to make those changes and vice versa as well. At the tokens layer, we'll probably need to define a process for what happens when we change the value of one of those tokens. You know, with great power, tokens are powerful. I can, I can define that color in one place and sort of see it used all over, but also there's a lot of responsibility that comes with that, right? Some risk. So if I make a change to that color and it's unintentional, I could see a change ripple through the entire interface in a way that's maybe not fun <laughs> if, if it's not correct. So we wanna put some process in place to kind of cut back on that risk. At the core systems layer, we may need a process for deprecating an old core system. When you change perhaps the way you do layout in your, in your interface work, maybe you, you have to support your old layout system for a while while, organ, while the different subscribers sort of come on board with the new system that you're putting in place and giving them. So how do you walk them through that deprecation of an older uh, part of the system? And at the components layer, maybe we would have a process defined for accepting component modifications from subscribers. The, the likelihood that your system is going to do everything perfectly for everyone is probably zero. So how do we also, um, how do we make it so that a, a parts of the organization who need something different can make that modification and then push that work back into the system so other parts of the company get access to it? So again, just a handful of examples. There's lots and lots of processes that you'll probably define if you're, if you're working on a design system. And you're not gonna start with all of these defined at the beginning, right? So as they're needed is kind of the time to start putting them in place. Moving on from assets and processes, the third part is documentation. And this is really the, the, the sort of context, right? It explains why something is the way it is. It breaks down the when and how and, and all of that. Um, so a few examples here a point of view on color at that foundations layer, we may want to pull from the brand. There's lots of different colors we could use with the brand. What are the ones we want to focus in on for our interface? And I've just got a screenshot here from IBM's carbon design system to show you their documentation on their point of view around color. So you can kind of see they're talking about how they layer colors and how there's a set of blues that are used. That's the IBM blue and then specific set of colors for alerts. At the tokens layer, we may have a, some documentation that explains how do you name a token. <laughs> this is notoriously difficult. As you know, na naming anything is hard. Um, but getting folks to agree on what these names should be can be tricky. And so we need to define that. We need a, a, a set of documentation that explains that. And again, from Carbon, here's some information where they talk about how tokens are named. And that helps you as somebody who might be a subscriber to understand what a specific token does by understanding the, the process we go through to name it. <clears throat> At the core systems layer, we may have some documentation that explains how to use a theming system. So um, I put this core system together that, that lets you change you know, color and look and feel of an interface, but how do I actually use that as a subscriber? Here's again from Carbon, an example where they're talking through 
how you apply theming in the context of using Carbon for your digital interface. And then finally, uh, at the components layer, we may have some documentation that breaks down the pieces and parts of a button. And you can see here again from Carbon, they do that. And that what this does is it gives us the words we need to be able to have conversation about these pieces and parts of our interface, helps us be a lot more efficient in the work. So taken all together, um, this really gives us a way to talk about systems and to know that we mean the same things when we do. Um, so with this shared understanding, what I'd like to spend the, the, the next um, five or 10 minutes um, walking through is just out of the experience we've had doing a lot of this work, I want to talk to you about how systems mature. And so I have four kind of main things to share with you. There's these four stages of maturity that I'll cover really quickly. There's this concept called origin stories, which greatly impacts how a system matures. And then I have two really quick frameworks. One is just how to mature your system if you're working on one today. And one is how to maintain stability as the things around your system are kind of constantly in flux. So let's dive in quickly to the four stages of design system maturity. The first stage we just call building version one. It's about as simple as it gets. And really this is everything leading up to that first release. So obviously the decisions you make here have a big impact on how your system will, will look. Um, and this can look wildly different based on a lot of different factors, but really it's about digging into the foundations of your brand. It's about discovering the right scope, identifying some good partners and building something that's actually valuable for people you want to use it. Now, once you've released that first version, you reach stage two, which we just call growing adoption. Um, again, begins as soon as you release that first official version. And once it's live, the, the question is, will anybody want to use it? And um, that makes sense, right? You spend a lot of time and energy building a thing. You want to see that it's valuable to other folks. Um, so, you know, I, I, I like to focus here on this idea of making it easy and obvious to adopt, right? If you've built something people want to use, that's the easiest way to get them to use it. Um, you're also going to have to start thinking about how you support the folks who do use it. Um, and you, you can never stop evolving the system. So you want to iterate on the system, but you're kind of focused on prioritizing what's really important to potential subscribers. Um, now, once you've made it really easy and obvious to adopt and you've reached a critical mass of adoption, you kind of transition into what we call stage three, surviving the teenage years. Um, this is sort of a whole new set of challenges that emerges, right? With lots of subscribers using your system, you're going to have lots more bug reports, right? People complaining about the system. You're going to get lots of feature requests, I hope. You're going to get people trying to do stuff with the system you never imagined they would try to do. So that creates an interesting set of challenges for you. And of course, this is where you have to kind of prove that your system will offer the benefits to the organization that you promised it would back in stages one and two. And so this is where like, analyzing the metrics and making sure that the, the data you have, you're capturing around the use of your system and the efficiency and consistency and all those benefits, accessibility and sustainability, all of those things are actually coming to fruition. Um, the focus here is really on thinking about that sort of product team, that product mindset. Um, a lot of um, organizations in stage three are also working through accepting, you know, um, contribution and, and they have some governance in place. They're starting to think about, they recognize they can't do it all themselves at this stage. And then finally, stage four, we call evol evolving a healthy program. And this is really where your system is a fully realized product, but beyond that, even a, a whole program. Um, there's highly evolved engagement with subscribers here. Um, you're, you're, you're really taking a place of leadership inside the organization. These are teams that are um, mentoring their, their subscriber teams. They're really working with those teams to make them better at what they do. Um, and the way I summarize this is that you're maturing into truly stable leadership here. Now, every organization has different experiences through these stages. Um, and so when I was originally doing this work, I, I, I didn't know that we could find a common model of maturity. And then I kind of discovered there's this one sort of concept that really impacts how a system matures, and that's called origin stories. And I've identified two kind of primary origin stories. The first we call top-down. <clears throat> that's when executive leadership is involved, aware, and actively supportive of that first release. 
And the other we call grassroots. And that's where your leadership was unaware, uninvolved, or unsupportive of the first release. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the differences quickly here. Um, there's a lot more visibility. There's an actual budget established. There could be a, a real team dedicated um, in that top-down model when leadership is involved. The scope also tends to be broader here because you've got uh, leadership thinking about the impact this could have across the entire organization. And there's a lot of, of pressure to deliver because leadership is involved. With grassroots, less visibility, of course, often no budget. Um, the team isn't really defined. And the scope is narrow because it's usually an individual contributor solving their own problems. Um, and not a lot of pressure to deliver here. Um, now, if you're looking at this and thinking, I've had a little bit of both of those in my experience, that's true. And that's because top-down and grassroots are, are really two ends of a spectrum. Um, most systems mature with some characteristics of both of these. It helps me to think about them kind of in this way. Um, and, and really, the origin story is about how that initial version of the system came to be. So the differences between a top-down stage one and a grassroots stage one are going to be pretty noticeable. But as the system matures, the differences become more subtle. They become more and more like each other so that by stage four, the differences between a top-down and grassroots system are often indistinguishable. So you could have a scenario like this, a top-down system becoming more like a grassroots um, sort of along that extreme side. You could have the opposite, a grassroots becoming more like a top-down system as it matures. But these are the extreme paths. So there's lots of other ways you can kind of move through um, these origin story and, and um, maturity, maturity steps. So we've got the four stages. We have this sort of concept of origin stories. Now let's talk quickly about what we do to actually have our systems mature in a healthy way. Um, so in order to do this, no matter what origin story you have, there's three areas of focus you always have to be working in. Those three are educate, engage, and evolve. And when I say educate, I mean more of like a one-way interaction. This is you creating a shared understanding of what a system is, especially in your context at your company. This is you casting a vision for why a system is needed, that kind of thing. Engaging is a little bit more two-way. This is where you're learning from your users. This is where you're, you're um, and allowing them to have some say in the things that you are building. Um, it's also you creating, you know, recruiting supporters, getting your leadership involved, that kind of thing. And then finally, evolution. This is what most people think of, right? The, the team effort of iteration on the system itself. So you've got to be adding features. You've got to be adding components or removing components, that kind of thing. Um, working on your assets, your documentation, and your processes. Now, I wish I could say that it's as simple as do the education, do the engagement, do the evolution, but it's not that simple, right? I think of it more like this. It's sort of a cycle that you're always kind of working on these things. And after you do this long enough, you kind of look up and you realize, oh my goodness, we've moved into stage three. Um, so we can overlay these things, right? We can take this, this concept of these three E's and layer them on top of the stages that we have. And what you'll see is you can't really stop doing the items from stage one as you move into stage two, but there are a new set of things you have to think about. And so this, we call this a, an additive uh, framework. In other words, the work just continues to grow. <laughs> so I don't intend to scare you off, but I do want you to see that there's a lot that has to happen to make this work. Okay, last concept to share with you quickly is about system stability. And I think this is really important because as you know, everything around you is just always changing, <laughs> um, just like any other product, right? And I think of these as destabilizing forces. I can't tell you how many times I've been in a conversation with a, with a, a client, we're getting started on a great work, and then all of a sudden somebody's boss's boss changes and everything has to be reevaluated, right? That change creates instability in the, in the organization. So what we want to do is surround our system with really stable uh, characteristics so that when things change, the system at least has a lot of stability. In the research we've been doing and in the work, we've identified three kind of primary stabilizing forces. Those three are authority, value, and tradition. So just a moment, it'll take to walk through these and then we'll grab some questions here. The authority stabilizers, uh, what I mean by that is that the leadership is actively supportive of the system and its team. Um, actively, obviously, is the critical word here. So if you can't point to things that your leadership is doing every day, 
that means you're probably not benefiting a lot from this stabilizing force. You see things like real budgets, dedicated time and staff, you know, encouragement from leadership to contribute to the system, not just use it in organizations that have this stabilizer. Value means that the system itself offers real value to those who use it. It actually helps them in some way with their work. It makes them faster or maybe more consistent. Um, it, it's going to solve real problems instead of create new ones for them. Uh, the kind of things you see in, in systems with the value stabilizer are rapid adoption or you know a lot of feature requests, a lot of bug reports, and a willingness from those subscribers to actually help with the system itself. And the third stabilizer is tradition. It's a little bit different. It means that the system itself has sort of momentum to it. It's become the way we build interfaces inside of our organization. And really, once the system has taken root, there's a lot of stability simply in its acceptance as our way to build interfaces. A sign that you have this stabilizer maybe is when you hear folks from different disciplines saying that the system is the single source of truth. Now, the tradition stabilizer is a little bit unique. You can only earn it with time. So you have to have authority and value over time in order to have tradition. Um, so <clears throat> I'll also say these three are kind of like the legs of a tripod, right? With one, you can kind of fall in any direction, not very stable. With two, you've, you've got some limits in terms of which direction you have stability, but you do have some stability in certain areas. And with three, you really can't fall over in any way. And that's kind of what we want is to kind of maintain that area in the center. Now, once you have them all three, of course, it's possible to lose them. <laughs> um, an example might be in this sort of area between authority and tradition. This is a risky place to be, right? If you slow the evolution of your system or stop engaging with your subscribers, you might lose this value stabilizer. And that puts you in this weird place where leadership says this is what to do. Tradition says this is how we do it but it's not valuable to your subscribers. They're not gonna feel like they're trusted, right? You're telling them to do something that actually doesn't help them. Not a good place to be. And this other spot down here between value and tradition, also a risky place to be. If you remember that story that I told you at the beginning about that organization and they called and they said, stop all the work on the design system. This is actually what happened to us. We had created something that was really valuable and it had become tradition. Lots of parts of the organization were using it, but we had never done the work to go and talk to leadership. So when the amount of money they were spending on this line item called design system crossed some threshold, it bubbled up to an executive somewhere who didn't even know what this was. They called and said, stop the work because they needed an explanation. Now, lucky for us, we were able to go back and talk to those subscribers and say, do you remember the work we did over the last year with the system together? How long would it have taken you to do that work without the system? So a little bit of a, a guess, but we got some great answers back. And what we learned is that for every dollar they invested in the system, they saved $3 in just in developer efficiency. So that was able to move us to that center again. We got support from leadership and created a lot more stability in that system. So all together, this gives us a way to create stability in the system that we're working on. And that enables a real sustainable approach to the work. Um, so four stages, the origin stories, a framework for how to mature, and some concept of stability in your system. Now, I'll tell you, there's a lot more to all of this. You can tell I'm moving quickly because I wanted to get these concepts shared with you. I'll just give you a couple quick resources here. Um, I mentioned that survey that we do each year. The results for 2022 are live. You can see that here. If you search design system survey, you'll find that as well. Um, We've done a bunch of studies at Sparkbox. One of them shows, um, it's just a study to kind of show the impact that a system can have on efficient on efficiency. Um, we, uh, we developed a little calendar you can use to sort of, you subscribe to this, it shows up on your calendar, put some interesting reminders to kind of think about those three E's, right? How am I educating? How am I engaging? Not just focus solely on evolution. So this um, is a nice little tool for uh, reminding you about those things. Um, I've written an article on selling design systems because that's a huge part of this work. And so if you're interested in learning how to do that work a little bit better, the selling part of the job, this will, will give you some insights there. Sparkbox does do gap analysis or design system um, consulting. So if you're interested in that, you can check out our site. Um, 
And then uh, we developed a maturity assessment. So if you're not sure where you fit in that model, you can go and answer just a handful of questions here. It'll kind of give you some customized recommendations on things you can do. It's all automated. So you don't have to talk to me if you don't want to. <laughs> um, but that's a really fun little tool to use. And I'll just say that this model is always evolving. So I'd love to hear your story of maturity. If yours is a little different, um, I created a little place for you to go. You can ask a question or give me some feedback or um, just say hello if you'd like. And the last thing I'll say is that none of this could have been possible without the amazing team at Sparkbox. I'm really lucky that I get to work with such kind people and smart people. You can see all of their smiling faces on sparkbox.com. Thank you all so much for listening. Great. Thank you very much, Ben. That was really good. And um, there was a lot of links at the end there. So I hope um, if you'll yeah. share the slides with me, I'll, I'll put them up on the site so anybody can Absolutely. access the, the slides afterwards as well. So they can get through all of those links that you shared. Yeah. Um, excellent. So uh, if anybody has any questions, I'm just looking over to see if anybody's posting. Please do feel free to ask some questions. I'll, I'll get the ball rolling with one. Um, because I was kind of thinking as you were explaining that that growing model from the, the foundations to the tokens, core systems, etc. And what jumped into my mind was if I was trying to design that from the outside in, I'd kind of fall into that trap of trying to over engineer from the start. Yeah. So my brain jumped to that what likely would happen is that I'd zigzag in and mm. out as I'm as I'm making it. And then I'd hit on what you pointed out of changing tokens and that can have ripple and unintended consequences. So what is the solution for the people who they're trying to build a component and realize, ah, oh, you know what, I need I need a different token or I need yeah. something. So so what is the best yeah. practice there? Um, I'm a fan, especially in the early days of, of systematic work, of <clears throat> not thinking much about the system at all as you get started, right? Just build the thing you need to build. And then using sort of this concept of refactoring to look for the commonalities, right? Your, your system should be serving the organization in areas where there's overlap, right? Not serving every unique need. So that's where it's like, until we know something needs to be a part of the system, we just build it. And we, and we use, maybe we use some of the same colors and tokens and things like this. Uh, every, everything needs color, right? So we can, we can use those across the organization. But when we get to the components, like you're describing, that's where I, I'm a fan of saying, let's build this. And then, you know, if, if we feel that it's valuable for lots of parts of the organization, then we can refactor it into the system. And that is really one of the core jobs of the systems team. Um, so your, your subscribers may be working on, on pieces and parts that aren't in the system. And once they've completed those, you can then think about, because you have a connection to all the other parts of the organization, you can say, is this valuable to you? If so, we'll bring it into the system. We'll, we'll help you sort of figure out how to implement it. You know, So that's kind of the approach we typically would take. Great. And, and how do you tackle then, like, so you bring it in, you go, we need to change the token. So as you were saying, that it's a high risk activity so do yeah. you have any recommendations for how people when they get into that situation where they're like oh, mm -hmm. oh dear i need to do this yeah that's where having that process in place you know around like what what is it that we're actually going to do here when we do need to make a change like that um the, the power is amazing right i remember that that same customer I was describing earlier, after about a year after all that, all the story that I told, they had a, a rebrand happen. And the people on their systems team got really nervous. They were thinking to themselves initially, this is going to create, this is going to all of a sudden like make our system not valuable anymore because the brand is changing. And we kind of looked at it in the opposite way. And we said, no, you're the enabler. You are the, you are the reason that the brand will be able to roll out much faster. And so that, that is the value of the system, right? So instead of going to the product teams to do a rollout, they went to the systems team, did the rollout at the system level and saw that spread across the entire organization much faster. Of course, that is the reward. The risk is somebody accidentally changes a token somewhere value and then that color ripples through. So we do the same kind of thing we would do with any other product, right? We just have checks and balances in place and we have some automated testing that happens and, and we're, we're, we're monitoring things. You know, if there's a tremendous amount of change, then we just want to slow down for a moment and say, was that the intent? <laughs> you know, um, and I think, you know, we there's so much out there about how systems are useful or valuable for 
uh, UI designers and, and front end developers. But there's so much value in a system for people like QA, you know, people who are just testing everything. I mean, to have all of the pieces and parts in one place where I know what they're supposed to look like, you know, that's that's huge. So that's where you're, it's not, it's got, you got to think beyond just designer developer into the, all the other parts of the organization too. And that's where it becomes really valuable. Great. No, thank, thanks for, for that. Um, yeah, I, I have one other question. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, one of the challenges that I find when you're moving into that tradition kind of element is that instead of being the enabler that it once was, it can sometimes, these kind of systems can sometimes be a bit too constraining in that people have felt that, okay, well, well now we have to use the design system and their hands, they're, they're, they're not as, it's not as flexible as it used to be where they had basically a blank sheet of paper. So how do you find, or how do you tackle that balance between the speeding up of using the system versus the kind of flexibility and the, the raw power of, of going along? Yeah, this is such a good question. Such a, <clears throat> there's a lot of nuance, I think, in this conversation. And I've always thought about this like flexibility versus consistency, right? Like the benefit of the system is that it gives us a consistent interface, but that consistency means we've had less creativity, I would say, maybe in the, in the, in, in the coming up with that interface, you know? But what I, what I would say is like, Designers, because those are the folks who usually have this issue, right? The people who are who who say my job is to design the interface. Why are you sh why are you taking that away from me and putting it into a system and automating it? But the truth is, designers are problem solvers, you know. And if you want to just spend every day solving the same problems over and over again, then I guess you you probably don't want a system. But if you're if you're tired of solving those common problems over and over again, that's where a system comes in, right? So we solve a problem really well once, and then every part of the organization gets the benefit of that good work. Now you can move on to solving a new problem. And that's what we, that's what we really need the human brains working on. You know, those designers need to be solving those new problems. So I, I ge genuinely don't think that uh, systems are constrictive or they don't have to be that kind of restrictive system. We try to help our clients build systems that are enablers, not restrictors. Um, but there is a balance there, you know, um, depending on the culture of your organization. This is another area where I'm doing a lot of research around uh, culture in terms of systems. If you've got a much more sort of competitive or a more controlling culture, sometimes that more restrictive approach actually is better for the, for the culture. So there's a spectrum there, you know, of how you how you think about the processes you're putting in place and kind of what the expectations are on the subscribers you have. Excellent. Yeah, it's, um, I, I like that introducing culture at the end there, the, because I think that does actually play a huge, huge role. I've just seen a question come in from from Gary Chan, who said, I've been a part of poorly coded design systems that got launched and negatively affected sales. There didn't seem like there was any way to repair it other than completely recording everything that took more than a year to deploy. Uh, recoding, so everything. This reflected badly on the design team. Any suggestions on how to handle this? Yeah, I mean, this is a similar question. Thank you, Gary. This is a similar question to what you were asking around sort of tokens, you know, where <clears throat> in the, the token example is if, I, if, I'm, if I've got everybody using this primary blue token and then I change the value of that, it's great unless I didn't mean for that to happen, right? Then it's rolled out everywhere. Well, the same thing is true with the system as a whole. In other words, if I create a system that that performs more poorly than what we have in production today and I roll it out to everybody, I'm actually doing a disservice, right? Um, and so that's just something where you, you, you know, this is why the, the and, and when we, re, when we, when I talk to these stage four teams, they're the, they are literally considered some of the, the highest qualified individuals inside the, the digital teams. These are the, these people are mentoring the rest of the organization because the, the, at this stage, the organization gets it. They see that we want to put our best people on this stuff because this is the work that's going to the entire company. So it's not like you just want to, I mean, I know some people do this, but you don't want to just go get some third party you know, framework and just make that your system and start modifying it. This is, that's very risky to do, you know, instead we want to really take our time with this stuff and do it well. And, um, 
I would also say to start really small and start simple. You know, perhaps all you do at the beginning is some type and some color work and get that working throughout the entire organization and see the benefits of that. And then maybe you can start to put some stuff in place that maybe is a little higher risk, but also a little higher reward. You know, the way we do layout perhaps across all these, all these platforms could be consistent. Let's do that and let that stuff sort of work its way in. I'm not a fan of that big bang. Let's redo everything and then release it all, all at once. You know, that's just, that's just a disaster waiting to happen. <laughs> I'm sorry you had that experience, Gary. Um, but, it's, uh, and I guess once you're there, I'm not quite sure what to tell you other than maybe you start refactoring. <laughs> so, no, that's a uh, great advice. I, I equally am not the biggest fan of the, uh, the big bang approach. So, um, hopefully, hopefully you, uh, Gary says, thank you for your advice. So hopefully nobody else has to suffer that. Um, but I think that, that brings us up to, to time. So thank you very much, uh, Ben, for yep. sharing all of your wisdom about um, design systems and maturing and how they grow. So I hope everybody out there enjoyed it as well, uh, as much as I did. But um, that brings us to the end for today. So thank you once again, Ben. And I'll just sure. give a very quick um, sign off. So if you did enjoy that talk today, and please do join us for our upcoming conference in the USA, which is taking place in New York in May. We'll have more than 25, probably around 35 plus speakers, eight workshops, there'll be 800 people attending. We have a fantastic venue just off Broadway Theater um, in New York. So if you did enjoy those talks today, please do think about coming and joining us there. Well, that brings us to the end for today. So thanks very much. And I hope to see you at the next event. Thank you very much. Goodbye.